and I am going to welcome Rod Everett, who will be talking to us about cultivating healthy soils and humans. So over to you, Rod. Hello, thank you all for coming um, on this beautiful afternoon. Um, and I hope I don't depress you too much with what I've got to say, but I think it's really important that we understand what this is about. Um, in the slideshow, there's quite a lot of words listen to what I'm saying rather than reading the words um, because that's more important than and so the words are there so you can come back to them later to look up references and things like that. So I'd like to start off with um, the natural food strategy. Henry Dimbleby um, gave a talk at the Oxford Farming Conference last earlier on in the year and some of his statements were dietary ill health in this country hasn't been seen as a medical emergency until now but before COVID-19, an estimated 90,000 people died from diet-related disease every year in the UK. That's one in seven deaths. He also said that 18 of the largest food and drink companies rely on portfolios of drink and food, which 85% are considered as regarded as unsuitable for marketing to children under the World Health Organization. So that's a pretty damning, damning statement from some of who have been looking at food as a national food strategy. He's also saying that this current crisis, um, this is published much more recently, painful though it is, it may soon pale into insignificance compared to the turbulence created by climate change and collapsing biodiversity. The current food system does terrible damage to the environment, building on a better future, where our food no longer makes us and our planet sick, will be the biggest challenge of all. So that's the, that's the format that I'd like to fit it into. So if we look at chronic diseases, since 1950 to now, 1950 chronic disease is 1.5%, now 52%. One in three males infertile, one in three females going towards infertility. In the US expected cancer, 80% of the population and one in three children to be suffering from autism by 2035. One in eight children suffers from asthma, one in four children allergic, one in six children suffer from a deficit disorder. So there's a massive indictment of, of our health service. So what I'd like to look at is the UK has also lost 84% of its fertile soil since 1850, losing on the order of one to three centimetres of soil every year. So a key part of that is actually realising how important the, the mineral content and the living state of the soil is to our food. So we've also lost, under the Real Food campaign in 2018, they were looking at the, the nutrient density of foods and comparing two carrots, one of them had the food density of 200 of the other carrots. So the variation in food density and nutrient density is massive. There's also been a big decline in, in minerals that are available. So in fruit, we've lost potassium, we've lost magnesium, we've lost calcium, we've lost 24% of iron, lost 20% of copper. In vegetables, we've lost 75% of magnesium, 76% of copper. In meat, we've lost 54% of iron, 24% copper. So one of the reasons we've lost those is because we use a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. When we lose nitrogen fertilizer, that means that the vegetables swell up, the cells inside the vegetables swell up. They get thin cell walls, but they have a lot more water. Um, and when they've got a thin cell walls, it also means they're susceptible to insect attack. So we tend to have to put insecticides and other chemicals to protect the, the plants. So that's all part of, of the farming system that we have today. And one of the things with, in the soil is the micronutrients. And it's critical that we actually get the micronutrients. So the micronutrients are vital to support a healthy immune system. Um, vitamin C inactivates viral DNA, thus limiting viral reproduction. Vitamin C aids antibody production of white blood cells. Amino acid lysine in synergy with vitamin C is important for blocking collagen and digestive enzymes and strengthening connective tissues. 
thereby controlling the spread of infectious diseases. So there are a lot of different things that the, the micronutrients really are important for us. And a recent study by A. Gok from the Dr. Rathman Research Institute, he was saying they've been looking at coronavirus infection and particularly they're finding that vitamin C, several of the minerals and amino acids and plant extracts were effective in significantly inhibiting two of the key steps in the coronavirus infection. So it's really important that these micronutrients are there available for us in our food. So go back to, I'm a farmer, I grow apples. And one of the things that is important with apples is getting a, a rich microbiome to the apples. So the insects come together, they pollinate the flowers. Then as the apples grow, they keep on increasing the microbiome in the apple in the stem of the apple, and we end up with a really healthy apple to eat at the end. Some work in Austria looked at the microbiome of, of the apples. So all these different colored pie charts show you the microbiome of the apples, whether it's organic or conventional. So if you just look at the one that says fruit pulp, on the organic one, you can see there's lots and lots of different colors. So there's a great diversity of microbiome. On the conventional one, there's very few colors in comparison. And that's really important to realize when we're eating food, what effect it's having on us. Um, the re results of that report are freshly harvested organic managed apples harbor more diverse, more even, and more distinct microbiota. So the, apple, the organic apples had favorable health effects for the consumer, the host plant, and the environment, and compared with the conventional apples, which were found to harbor potential foodborne pathogens. So that's what we're eating. I remember going to Lancaster University and selling apples there, and some of the students were saying, I can't eat apples, I'm allergic to them. So I said, just take these apples away with you and eat them and see if you're allergic to them. And they, they came back the next week and said, no, you know, we're all right eating these apples. It's not the apples they're allergic to, it's the chemicals on them that they're allergic to. In 2015, there was a pesticide residue in food. And this is what the, animal, what the UK government considers safe to eat. So 65 out of 70 non-organic apples contain pesticide residues. There are 23 pesticide residues in total. 10 of these are described as bad actors because they're carcinogenic endocrine disruptors, reproductive toxins or cholinesterase disruptors. 30 of the apples contained fault, captan and foltet, which is a bad actor. And 21 of those were at a level that will kill minnows. So that's the apple itself would have enough of that chemical in to kill a minnow. Five apples contain triflux strobin, at levels to kill trout. One contained phenyl oxycarb at 50 times the level that would kill Western mosquito fish. 15 of the captain folpet samples were above the US Department of Health maximum contaminant level. And eight apples contained dithocarbonates banned in the, for use in the UK. So that's what we're that's what we're eating when we buy apples from the supermarket that aren't organic. If we're buying organic apples, um, unfiltered apple juice and skins are a good source of phytochemicals. They offer antioxidant and anti-inflammatory protection. The American Institute of Cancer said that peel is helpful in fighting cancer. The University of California pulp protects the heart against heart disease and it also helps with asthma and apple juice itself contains 10 vitamins including a c and b6 and a good range of minerals including calcium magnesium calcium phosphorus manganese and iron so that's what we're getting if we're eating healthy organic apples so the same sort of picture is there with all our foodstuffs. 
that aren't organic. So this is a report that came out from the, the Soil Association on pesticide cocktails, chemical co cocktails. 43% of bumblebees had detectable levels of two or more pesticides. In one bumblebee, there were seven pesticides. Two thirds of river samples contained over 10 pesticides. 67% of soil samples contained multiple pesticides. 25% of them had more than six pesticides and four had 10 pesticides. In 2017, 40% of all fruit and vegetables contained pesticide cocktails. 25% of our bread contains multiple pesticides. So it's a pretty depressing picture of actually looking at what we're eating. And when you're deciding, when the government's deciding whether it's safe or not to eat a, eat a, have a particular pesticide, it's to arm the, particular, the pesticide itself, not as the cocktail. So the cocktail is much, much more damaged, often much more damaging than the, the main chemical itself. So do we use a lot of pesticide, fungicide, herbicides? So from 1990 to 2016, there was a 63% increase in pesticides, 69% increase in fungicides, and a 60% increase in herbicides. Insecticides went down um, as the area went down. On average, our UK potatoes are sprayed 32 times, 32 times. I said again, 32 times our potatoes are sprayed. It's, it's mind bending really to think that that is going on. And I want to concentrate on one particular uh, herbicide in particular, which is glyphosate. And glyphosate is the main constitute of Roundup. Between 1990 and 2016, there was nine times more land sprayed with glyphosate. 9.9% .9 times more glyphosate. In 2019, 30% of the total land area in UK agriculture, so the equivalent of that area was sprayed with glyphosate. It's used to desiccate cereals, to kill vegetation before planting, using gardens, verges, streets. So it's, it's something that we use, every, almost everything you buy has glyphosate in it, if it's not organic. It's even got, it is in the air, it's in the rivers, um, and some work on, from Italy on rats, but the chemical glyphosate found the world's most usually widely used what weed killer can have destructive effects on the sexual development, genes and beneficial gut bacteria at doses considering safe, according to a wide ranging study on rats. It shouldn't be happening, but it's quite remarkable that it is. The disruption of the microbiome has been associated with a number of negative health outcomes, such as obesity, diabetes, and Im immunological problems. So where do we find it in our food? So we find it in the wheat, which is desiccated with Roundup. We find it in soya, which is GMO, often coming from South America or even from the States. We find it from cows who are fed with GMO soya. We find it in potatoes that are desiccated with herbicides, including glyphosate. We find it in a lot of the oils that we use and the syrups that we use. We also find it in nearly all the, the cereal crop. If you buy a, a cereal that has oats in it or wheat in it, it's almost certainly got glyphosate in it. So is that a problem? So this is a list of the, the MLR, MRL, is what's considered a safe limit according to the European Food Safety Authority. So if you look at the top few, it's all 0.1, and they're asking you for it to go, this is the outcome of the review, that it can go down, 0.05. Then you look at other things. And for olives, it was one part milligram per kilogram. They're wanting it to go to 30 now. Barley grains are up in the 30s already. Wheat, buckwheat, and other grains going from 0.1 to 30. Millet, 0.1 to 30. Oat grains from 20 to 30. Rye and wheat going from 10 to 30. So that's what the recommendations are. So that's what we're asking for as recommendations to change the level, not based on. So this is supposed to be food safety. It's 
not it's not food safety we're talking about this is about how much they find in the food so it's, it's something completely it's not a food safety standard it's a how much pesticide occurs in the food so to me that's completely the wrong way around deciding if something safe um, we've also got it here for for animal bride products so you'll see particularly the kidney cow kidney and sheep kidneys are both high levels of it um, but if we go back to the, the previous slide they're recommending 0.05 so to me that's the safe level that we should be talking about with everything if it's above that we shouldn't be using it um, with meats it's also very difficult to detect glyphosate in its meat structure and it needs very specialist tests to do that we've also got the the farmers farmers have been com convinced by Monsanto, well, 2016, Monsanto spent 9.3 million pounds on lobbying the EU to make a profit of 5.2 billion. Um, in the UK, there's a Daniel Beatty is the is the lobbyist for Bayer. He's the government and industry affairs manager. So this is a group of Yorkshire farmers who are really campaigning to to save glyphosate and be able to use it. And if you look at the the panel, how glyphosate works for all of us. The first one is about lapwings and partridge and skylark. And what they need is they need insects. They need the, in the soil, they need the, the bacteria and the fungi that lead to, eventually lead to the, the insects being there as a food crop. If you put the glyphosate on it, you affect all the microbiota of the soil and you damage the food chain. So it's a load of rubbish, that is. It's what they've said there, Mechanical weed control is true, but the effect that, it, that glyphosate does have an effect on that things. Same with the earthworms. Earthworms research shows that when you first put glyphosate onto the land, it kills the bacteria and the fungi. That becomes available as a foodstuff for the earthworms. So the earthworms increase in number and then they start dying. So it's, it's, it's a complete con and we must be really careful of taking statistics and half statistics. So these, all these statements on this thing are true to some extent, but they're also lies because they don't relate to the true research behind glyphosate. So coming on to the microbiome. So this is the microbiome <coughs> is the thing that keeps us healthy. So it's, bacteria, parasites, fungi, viruses. In a human health, healthy system, we have something like 40,000 species of bacteria, 300,000 species of paras parasite, 4 million species of fungi, and millions of viruses. So that's in a healthy system. Most of these aren't damaging, but are life-giving to the human body. Um, they're also really important in producing the essential amino acids. Um, and it's only really probably in the last five years that we've really started to understand the microbiome. So this is a completely new area of medicine that's going to be really important. And it, sh it should be able to come up with understanding of what's going on in our guts and our food system. But one thing that's really important that any modification in the composition of the gut microbiota affects the human health by leading to conditions such as obesity, diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, autism, depression, anxiety. So anything that changes the gut microbiota can do that. So if we look at glyphosate again, it kills the plants, it kills the bacteria through the same mechanism. It blocks an enzyme pass pathway called the shikimate pathway. And that's one that produces really useful amino acids. One of the amino acids is glycine. And glycine that's really important in building proteins and glyphosate is very similar. It's an analog of glycine, but it's got an added nitrogen on it. So when the, when the body's building proteins, it can 
instead of having glycine, it can put in glyphosate as a replacement for it. But the glyphosate, when it gets into there, it blocks phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. Um, so those are all really important things for brain function. Serotonin, which maintains the mood balance, well-being, and happiness. If it's a deficiency, it leads to anxiety, insomnia, poor diet, aggression, impulsive behavior, weight gain, fatigue, poor memory. Phenylalanine and tyrosine make dopamine. Um, it's a neurotransmitter for both physical and mental well-being. And if there's a deficiency, depression, schizophrenia, psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, obesity, Parkinson's disease. So we're actually creating problems that can be so, um, it can, they can go across whole, the whole of society, these problems, and they are getting more and more toxic. Another thing that glyphosate does is it breaks down the tight junction in the gut. Um, it does this by getting, um, it chelates trace minerals out of the, out of the, the system and it creates a sulfate deficiency. Um, the sulfate deficiency and you get an increase in sulfites and then you get hydrogen sulfide creating in the, in the gut system and that leads to a leaky gut. So it's something that's, that's not a good thing at all to have. So in a good, good gut system, the microbiome system, you have lots and lots of different commensal microbiota. So that's all the different organisms. When something pathogenic comes in, they grab it, they lock it up and kill it. Um, but if it's inflamed bowel system, then the pathogenic ones can get in. And it also creates little holes in the gut wall. And the little go holes in the gut wall also enable microplastics to enter the gut. And microplastics are related to a lot of the reproductive problems that we're getting. So it's a disaster um, for human health. So basically this glyphosate can link with diabetes, obesity, asthma, a whole lot of other things that are the modern chronic diseases. Um, that's work from um, Anthony Samsel and Stephanie Seneff in California, who've been the key people looking at this. The other thing with glyphosate is it affects the genetics of the microbiome. So this is our system. I know Ella's watching, little Ella at the bottom. <laughs> um, but on the top, on the top um, right hand, top left hand side, are my grandparents. None of those had any, they all had organic food because there wasn't anything else in those days. My mother and my father, they basically had organic food all through their childhood until the 1950s. I was born in the 1950s, so I had started to get a lot of the chemicals that were coming out in the 1950s. Um, and my daughters will have inherited some of those problems maybe. And also if you look down Jane's side, um, there's the same thing. And one of the things that appears to happen is that you can inherit your gut biome. Something like 30% of the genetic material that we have in our bodies is through the gut biome. And that's really important in the first year of our life. So it's from conception to a year old. So we take in that gut microbiome at that time we get it through natural birth, we get it through breastfeeding. Um, Caesareans have a negative effect on the microbiome. So that's a key point, is getting this gut biome at the right time. Um, I'll stay on that for a moment. No, go back to that one. I won't go back. So what, so one, sorry. So one of the things with that is that if you've got a family that are in a, a poor area eating a very poor diet, or not necessarily poor area, they can be very rich in eating a very poor diet, 
um, that's full of glyphosate, it's full of other pesticides, those are going to affect your gut microbiome. If you're just about to have a child, and in that first year, it's really important that that gut microbiome gets established, and it also that it gets infected by something that might, might it, so it has to respond to an infection, to kick it into action. And it's really important that this kicking into action in that first year happens. So I have a, a bit of a worry about all the, the antiseptics and everything that's going on at the moment. Everyone is so clean that actually what our gut microbiome isn't being challenged at all. So young children today may really suffer in the long term. So I think we need to be really careful with that. So it's much better to be tramping around in the mud, out in the woods. We look at our UK vegetables. Something like 40% of our UK vegetables come from Spain, um, on the south coast of Spain. You can see in the top left-hand corner, there's nothing there but plastic. Um, it's incredibly damaged soil. It's polluting the sea. It's a sea of plastic. And that is so damaging to the environment. But that's where our vegetables come from that are cheap in the shops. If we're buying animal feed, if we're buying animals to eat, if we're buying cheap chicken, they're coming from a system like this. Massive numbers of chickens, thousands of chickens in the same, in the same hen house. If we're buying intensive beef, it's coming from a, a big yard where they're almost all fed on imported GM crops something like 85% of the EU's compound food is genetically modified. And most of it is coming from South America. So it's, to me, that's a totally unacceptable system that we have. If it's coming from South America, it's also damaging to the Arams and rainforest. So we've got also that to, to think about and its effect on climate change. So what are some of the alternatives? Looking at regenerative agriculture, holistic management, one thing is mob grazing with if you're mixing sheep and cattle, moving them on every day, um, gets stimulates the manure, stimulates the microbiology of the soil, um, and it really helps to build a healthy soil, and it also helps to create diversity of the plants in the in the fields. With grazing a pasture, it tends to get in the milk and in, in the meat, we get much higher levels of omega-3 fats. Um, if we look at omega-3 fats, they have a much lower melting point. So if you take, if you take meat and it goes all, all greasy really quickly, as it cools down, that means it's got a high level of omega-6 fats in it. So what we're really trying to get is to get a meat that's, if it's grass-fed, it's much higher on vitamins, particularly vitamin A and carotene and vitamin E. And generally they have higher mineral levels and they have higher conjugated linoleic acid from three to five times more and that's useful against heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. So what we're looking at here is if you're buying stuff that's been shoved full of cereals, you're talking about something like a 15 to one ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. If you're looking at a grass-fed system, you're talking about four to one. So it's not just grass-fed. Look out for the word pasture-fed rather than grass-fed. Grass-fed grass -fed has been abused, and if animals are on grass for 50% 50, 50 of the time, it's considered grass-fed. Um, Pasture-fed is a, is, a, is a designation like organic. A third of all the cereals that we produce are fed to animals. And up seven to eight kilograms of cereals produce one kilogram of beef. So really what we're talking about there is trying to, if you're going to eat meat, it's really important to eat meat that's from 
grass-fed, pasture-fed livestock. So how can we re repair this damage? So making sure your front, front line defense is good and that you have a good microbiome. So interaction with the natural environment is really important to that. It takes us back to the soil. So actually getting your hands into the soil, letting kids play in, in, in the wilderness, in wild areas, playing in the river, are all part of building that community. Chemical free gardening, growing and eating organic vegetables and fruit are a really key part of, of getting a healthy gut system. But just getting out and walking in these wild areas is, is important. If we're looking at the soil structure, so that's where we, where all these minerals come from is a really healthy soil structure. So these are some carrots from Claver Hill and you can see the the soil that's attached to the root systems. Because it's attached to the root systems, it means there's active soil biology going on at that point. If, you, if these were in, a, in a, just a chemical soil, those carrots would come out clean. They'd look beautiful, but they wouldn't have any of the bacteria that is really important to our gut biome. On the right hand side, you've got the soil structure. You can see it's got lots of little crumb structures. And in those crumb structures, you've got air, you've got quite a, um, you've got something like, in a really healthy soil, you've got something like 78% air in the soil. So in the crumb structure, you've got air around the outside of it. So you've got aerobic bacteria there. And right in the center of it, you've got no air and you've got anaerobic bacteria. And in the anaerobic bacteria, phase is when the, the plant roots can absorb the nutrients from it. In the aerobic, they can't, but it, in the aerobic it stops the nutrients from being washed away in the, with the rain. Um, so those are, it's really important to look at the, the health of the soil. So those who went for a walk this morning would have seen some of the vegetables at Clover Hill. Um, and Claver Hill really is, is doing a, a wonderful job of actually local food, encouraging people to think about local food and encouraging people to come and volunteer and, and take food away. Um, and it's grown with no agrochemicals and lots of compost. So building the soil food web is, is an important part of this. Um, so we will get the sunshine going onto the plant, the plant roots, the plant produces sugars. The sugars in the plant roots attract the, the beneficial bacteria and fungi. Um, the organic matter also contains the, the microbes and the animals. And you get bacteria, you get fungi. Fungi is a very important part of it because we've often lost the fungi. Um, we get fungi that are eaten by nematodes, you get bacteria that are eaten by nematodes, you get nematodes that eat the roots, you get protozoa that eat bacteria, you get nematodes that eat the protozoa, um, you get nematodes that are eaten by arthropods, arthropods that are eaten by other arthropods, you get the birds and the animals, so it's a very complex system in the soil food web. And all those parts are important to be there. Um, and if they're all there, We've got a really healthy soil and it's, the nutrients are available from it to the plants growing in it. Some of the way that we can get more of these, this soil biology into the farmland is to use compost based teas. <clears throat> so that's actually with the compost itself to use that as a base to put it in the liquid to make a tea from it and then spray that back onto the land. So that gives you a good, a good fertility. One of the compost based teas is, is the biodynamic 500. So biodynamic 500 is where you bury cow manure in the ground and all the bacteria in the, and the fungi in the soil go into the, the cow manure and they build up in it and then you 
once you've left it for six months or so, you bring it out and you stir it. And you stir it because it creates a vortex. And in the vortex, it lets a lot of air into it. So if there are a lot of anaerobic bacteria, they tend to get killed by that process. And the, the bacteria is converted to a, the aerobic system. And then that's sprayed back onto the ground. And that, in many cases, it's really helped build up the, the carbon layer in the soil. The cashew is another fertilizer. Um, the cashew is made from effective microorganisms. And this was developed in Japan. <clears throat> it's a way of bringing in fertility from, from nature, multiplying it using molasses and minerals, and then spraying that back onto the land or using it in the compost to, to really get the compost to break down quickly. Um, Biofertilizer, is a system where you're using cow manure. So the fresh cow manure that's come straight out of the gut is really rich in microbes. And by using milk, water, molasses, wood ashes and fine basalt powder, um, that's fermented and increases those bacteria massively and increases the fungi. So then that can be spread back on the land. And you may say that can only be done on a small scale. There's some of the places in the States that are using thousands of over a thousand acres um, using this sort of system. So it can be done on a large scale and would replace the, the nitrogen fertilizers. So it's important if we are thinking about our diet and on our health that we get, we eat local and we eat organic. The reason we need to eat local is because when you take the, pick the fruit, or pick the vegetables, it has a whole microbiome that's associated with it. If we eat that with that microbiome, we take that into ourselves and it becomes part of our microbiome. So if it's been treated with um, radi radiated some food in the supermarkets to make it a shelf life longer, it's destroyed all the, those micro microbes. So we actually want to take in stuff that's got the microbes. Um, we also need to enable people who have little money um, an, an education process to show people how to cook and prepare simple meals out of this fresh local material. So we should be able to end up with everyone being able to afford local and organic and cooking it simply rather than being buying ready meals of little food value um, or sugar-based foods. One of the things I'm doing is, is using the bacteria and the fungi and the yeast in nature <coughs> to convert the apple juice from my apples into cider and then from the cider into cider vinegar. Um, so what I'm aiming for with the cider vinegar is really to end up with a, a really high level of activity in there um, which is the mother helps keep us healthy in the cider vinegar. And one of the things that they found with the cider vinegar is it helps reduce the levels of glyphosate in our bodies. So I've been part of the Lancaster Food Futures for a while. And when I was looking for, for what we can do in Lancaster, I came across the Lancaster Farm Fresh Cooperative in the States. And I got really excited. I thought, this is happening in Lancaster. Isn't this amazing? Um, but unfortunately, it's Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, and what's happening here in Pennsylvania, it's, there's a lot of organic farms. The governor of Pennsylvania is encouraging everyone in Pennsylvania to grow organic. But in Lancaster, in particular, they've got 100 farms, organic farms now, that come together. They're all organic. They're producing vegetables, fruit, meats, eggs, dairy. Um, and they're feeding that into the system. They have a, a fleet of lorries that are going out into the town and they're going into the community supported agriculture. That's the CSA. It's going to restaurants, it's going to grocers, it's going to schools, it's going to hospitals, it's going to universities. And that's key to the, the health of the whole town. So I really, this is something that I would really love to happen in Lancaster. 
if we could get this system in Lancaster, so the hospital, you can imagine coming through the hospital, you've just gone, gone into the maternity ward, you get food in there that's organic, it's fresh, it's full of energy, it's full of the microbiome that you need for your child. Then we'll have a healthy system. And that's really important that we actually aim towards this. Also in the council, so the city council, if they insist that there's no glyphosate used on the streets and pavements in Lancaster, and really put a ban on it. And really what would be good to do is try and become a, a non-toxic neighborhood. And this is something they're starting to do in the States. They're trying to say particular neighbors, areas are becoming non-toxic neighborhoods. <clears throat> and if we could do that in Lancaster, that would be, I would be really excited by that. Um, so it's up to individuals to say, this is what we want to eat. It's up to the organizations to say, how do we get this? this? How do we get this food into the hospitals? How do we get it into the schools? How do we get it into the council? How do we get it into any conferences happening in the area? And a lot of that's to do with the procurement system. So we need a, a procurement system that allows local organic food to come into it. And then we can actually start using on a, on a scale that, that really makes sense. So one of the final things I want to look at is just, if we're just trying to decide what, we, what sort of foods we want to eat. We want foods that will give us soil health. So we've talked about that, if they're not getting a really healthy soil structure. We want a, a food that has no ecological damage. So we're spraying something that kills the insects, it's causing ecological damage. So, <coughs> so that's where, really where the organic side is important. It supports natural diversity. So the more diverse we have on a system, the better. And that's also with the cows, the sheep, different poultry. The more diversity we have, the more diversity gets into the soil and the more diversity gets onto the plants that we're eating from it. The seeds, if we remove completely genetic modified seeds and really work with local and open pollinated seeds, that can really help adapt to climate change and, and make it a better system. Another thing is to do is to get community food skills. So that's where we have a, a can-do competence. So you know, if people don't know what to do, they don't just go out and buy a, a, a ready-made pizza. It's actually helping people to know how to, how to cook food, how to prepare it. Human health, you'd think was so obvious, but it, it isn't obvious or else we wouldn't have the system we have at the moment of our agricultural system. So hopefully the national food strategy, part two of that is looking at human health. And I hope, hope if Henry Dimbleby is allowed to write down what he wants to write down, it will be fantastic. He may well end up writing a report that is hidden by the government um, and not allowing it to change the agricultural system. Um, packaging and farm, farm materials, so trying to avoid getting plastics into our health food system. So even you know, organic, organic cheese, we bought some organic cheese recently, had three layers of plastic around it. Um, so that would be unacceptable. Animal health and local abattoirs is an important part of it. We've, changed, we've gone from a situation where we had, um, let me have a look. Yes, we had 30,000 local abattoirs. We've now got 250. So that means the animals have got to move much further and it's not local, there's not that direct interaction with the abattoir. The amount of energy used in processing and production is important, minimizing that. Supporting a primary producer with local processing and marketing. So keeping it local as much as possible. And the other thing on this is that the primary producer, the sales and the processing all obtain a living wage. At the moment, there are many vegetable growers who aren't really obtaining a living wage. So that's really important that that happens. 
And the other thing about food is that it creates local community. It can bring people together, sharing food. It, that's a really important part of, of what we should look at for resilient food. Um, hopefully over the winter, I'm hoping to, with Food Futures, um, to develop a game that helps people understand what makes resilient food. So that's something to, to look forward to. The final thing that I'd really like to say is that I hope that you can take, take these ideas away and then we can actually start to change things in the area. Um, one of the things that we're doing again with Food Futures and less is to run the Northern Real Farming Conference, which starts a, a week on Monday. Um, there's over 50 farmers speaking at it from the north of England, from Scotland, and there's some really exciting talks. And the main thing about this conference is about trying to get people to think about doing things in a way that helps the ecology. So we're looking after the, the ecology, the natural ecology, as well as producing food. And if we can do that, if this can become a movement, the, the Oxford Real Farming Conference, who've been helping us set this up, uh, they had over a thousand people at the last conference in January. So hopefully this, uh, this is online, so we'll, we'll see how it works. Um, but I encourage you to look at, look at this, to get farmers to share this, and take us to a future where we've got a future for our children and our grandchildren. And that's the important thing to me. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. There was a lot in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, can, great, you've stopped sharing your screen so I can see everyone. Um, whilst you were talking, quite a few questions came up in the chat. So I'm going to just work through them and if anyone else has any other questions, please um, just keep putting them in the chat or we can open up for people to ask them directly. So the first question was, where can people go to learn more about the loss of fertile soil? So someone found it hard to believe that the UK lost 84% of fertile soil. So where would you recommend to go to learn more about this, Rod? There's a group called Farmers Footprint in the States um, who are a key, um, Zach Bush is one of the key people who, who is working, working with that. Um, so he's working with farmers in the States. Um, there's Elaine Ingham in, also in the States who's been looking at the, the fertility, building up fertility. Um, there's, I um, can't remember her name, someone from New Zealand who's now gone to the States. <laughs> Um, but really it's it's about and it's not there's it's not common to it's not easy stuff to find um, I mean all the bits of information I've brought together are from all over the world and it's only by bringing them together you can actually see the whole um, if you take take one at a time you can knock it down but if you bring all the all the more together it makes a lot of sense and it's worth saying that the Sustainable Food Trust, they have um, quite a comprehensive website that has lots of people talking about issues that rugs raids today. So their website's pretty good as well. Um, another, uh, there's another place actually, just Kiss the Ground in California have produced a, a booklet. So you can, if you look up Kiss the Ground, um, there's a, a booklet there that gives details of, of how you can work on buying food and how you can look after the soil. Yeah, and um, the second question, I'll merge it in a few people are similar things. So organic food and fermented foods um, can be perceived as things for the elite or the wealthy. They also have a hipster image. Um, and th there's a question of how do we actually mainstream these, what are now perceived as alternatives. So how can we get to a point where um, farming systems that use chemicals are called chemical farming and we don't even need the term organic. How can we mainstream um, healthy produce? And I guess that's a question for all of us. Yeah. Not I think education, organic. education is the key thing. Actually understanding what's going on. I mean, it's, it's, taken, it's taken a lot of rooting around. I've been working on this talk for months. So actually sort of finding the information 
It's difficult to find, but it is out there. But if that can be shared, then it's, it's very compulsive to actually make changes. Um, and I think, I think we'll find that actually, I mean, the amount of money that's just being spent on the, that's going to be spent on getting kids to have, kids who can't get the fourth school meals to have school meals, if that can be made to be, to realize that that needs to be organic meals, then that would make so much difference. The Soil Associates have been pushing this for a long time, but it, farmers have got to change. And hopefully Henry Dimbleby's work will, will start that push. Hopefully the farming conference will help to push that. The organic farming conference, at, the Oxford Farm, Real Farming Conference is helping to change that. Um, but it takes, it's going to take a big shift. Um, but it is, hopefully it's, it's going to happen. And yeah, I guess it's worth saying it, it's not, the onus isn't on individuals, we need to change the bigger system. Yeah. So Rod mentioned procurement, he mentioned delivery networks, the example from America is a really inspiring example where we're hoping to head in Lancaster, but there may be a few <laughs> years ahead of us. Um, but it's that wider system change that also needs to happen to enable people to access organic produce. Um, so this is an, an interesting point. So Melanie mentioned that if glyphosate is banned, another chemical will just come out. And we see this pattern happen in lots of different cases. So as banks divest from fossil fuels, other large um, organisations pick up the financing of fossil fuel industries. And the same pattern happens in lots of spaces. So what can we do about this i guess is what's underlying the question well to some extent well one thing is exchange of information again i mean the pasture fed livestock association is fantastic every day they have a an exchange of, of knowledge so if you've got a problem say if you've got ticks or, or lice on the sheep you can ask what people are using and someone will come and say they're, they're using a garlic salt block um, so there's sharing that information is is important part of it the other side of it is to do with your MP, the House of Lords, and the House of Lords, the government was trying to slip through the agriculture bill without any amendments. The House of Lords has, has just recently managed to stop it to try and get the word sustainable food systems incorporated in it. Um, but it's, it's responding to any government actions to do with agriculture. And I think the key thing is actually trying to dismantle the, the lobbying system. The lobbying system that they have in, in the government, um, if people, if the lobbyists spend enough, spend enough money, they can go and have dinner with the ministers. Um, and it's a completely insane system that we have where people who are trying to make a lot of money out of it and don't care a damn about our health can get priority over people who are cared about, who care about our health and our, and our human life system. Yeah. Um, so Heather mentioned a good point that I guess is underlying a lot of what you have been talking about. But when the price of, of an organic tomato or apple is twice the price of a non-organic, um, you can and you can't see the real impact of of those products. It's very easy to just go for the cheaper option. So it comes back to the economic system, doesn't it? And how we internalize those those true costs, I guess. Yeah. Of food. It, one of the things that that is important is looking at this idea of community support of agriculture. So actually get a group of people together, either to maybe to buy a farm and actually run that organically pay someone to, to run it organically, it can, the price of food can come down dramatically. Um, and it's a bit like what happened at Claver Hill. And the Claver Hill is about volunteering, it's about growing vegetables together. It's about sharing, sharing that resource. So that isn't expensive. So it's really important that we actually create a lot of models like that, where we can access organic food we can grow organic food on allotments. We can grow organic food on our windowsill. Um, 
and that's it doesn't need to be expensive the thing that's expensive is actually dealing with all the mopping up the problems that are caused by non-organic food and that's what's really expensive um, whether the new environmental land management scheme which is coming in, in about three or four years will benefit organic um, will benefit people who are looking after the environment in enough ways to actually big, make a big change in the system that's what the hope is um, but time will tell to see how it gets watered down depending on how we interact with the american food system and, <laughs> and other things with trade deals yeah and then a few questions got raised about the american case study in lancaster so do you know if there's been how they've involved supermarkets or if they had a local supermarket and whether there's been any backlash to the cooperative model and do you know if they are collecting evidence on um i guess population health and whether that's improved alongside their work yes i don't know i'm finding it difficult to get in contact with them i've managed to get them to send me a newsletter regularly now but <laughs> actually trying to get I haven't found a person I can talk to communicate uh, with uh, because it's, it's quite a big organization now so actually finding the key people to talk to it'd be really nice to know what's happening there yeah. to see what's happening with with health in the town that's an action for us to connect yeah. up with that Lancaster group isn't it yeah. um, so there was a request if you could talk more about the composting system you discussed and i think it's the the one you provided the recipe for is that right alexander yeah, the biofertilizer yeah yeah um with the biofertilizer it's you can either start with with fresh cow manure because that's got all the gut bacteria from the four different gut systems in the stomach systems in the cow so that's what lands on the ground and it helps build the soil fertility so if you can capture that very early on and then ferment it with a mixture of milk molasses um, minerals so that can be a uh, something like seaweed or it can be wood ash and then fermenting that so as you ferment that it builds up all the bacteria and then um, that can be used as a, a fertilizer and um, there's a i've got a book in the in the other room on how to do it um there was a talk at the two years ago at the oxford, oxford real farming conference on biofertilizers so you could look back at the biofertilizer talk two years ago um, and that would that would give you more details of that but there are quite a number of different composting systems that are being developed there's a Johnson Sioux composting system that we're just trying at the moment, which is brushwood. So we're filling a big chamber with brushwood, leaving lots of air holes in it and letting that rot down. So that hopefully will have a much higher, higher um, fungal element. And outside the fungal, the fungal element then can be incorporated in the soil. If you incorporate the fungal element, we end up with a lot more carbon in the soil. Um, you tend to get um, a thing called, um, where are we? Got too many words going around in my head. Um, never mind. It's to do with the, the you get a car high carbon level around the, the hyphae of the fungi. And that's really important in fixing, fixing carbon. And it's important for, for transmitting soil around and nutrients around in the soil so we can if we can build the fungal side that really helps with maintaining the soil fertility in the for long term um, but there are quite a number of, there's a korean a korean composting system there's quite a few biofertilizer systems that are being developed at the moment but the important thing is not using npk out of a bag that uses very high levels of energy to create it and it damages the soil biology. Yeah, um, for just, people. <coughs> just on that, on that, there's also, I mean, at Claver Hill, we've been working on the, the water, the flooding side of Claver Hill, and the two of the streams that both come in 
they've been both growing algae um, recently and the algal growth suggests there's a high pollution coming in from the neighboring farms so that's what we're we're dealing with at the moment um, so hopefully making that visible enabling people to see it know it's there will help to to cure it in the long term yeah, and it's worth saying that um, around composting um, at the Real Farming Conference, but even if you can't go there, there's a group based at um, CORE, which is uh, part of Coventry University, so Coventry Agroecology and Water Resilience. And there's an Organic Plus scheme looking at lots of uh, vegan organic fertilisers and compost teas. And they're trialing, they have a huge trial at the moment with partners from all over Europe looking at different, um, the effects of different compost teas that are made up of plants that can be grown by the farm and used on the farm as well. So they're looking at closed loop systems for compost teas. Um, and they'll be talking at the Real Farming Conference and the recording will be shared for free with everyone as well. Um, Rod, Melanie has asked, do you have any information on the overuse of antibiotics with animal production? Only that it's a, it's a, it's a big problem that's antibiotic resistance, um, where the animals are, are fed, I mean, it was particularly with the poultry industry. Um, the amount of antibiotics have been reduced quite a lot now, but the, the poultry system um, and also some of the dairy industry is using quite a lot of antibiotics and that's coming through into the into a, into the humans and meaning that the antibiotics are no longer effective for humans so there's a big problem with antibiotic resistance of particular diseases um, so it's a big problem I don't know the, the full details of it but I do know that it's it's something that the vets are, we've got some vets coming on the, the farming conference so hopefully they'll be able to enlighten us a bit on on what's happening with that Great. Um, and Ruta has sent me a private message saying that um, she's been composting in her own garden, which I believe is in Morecambe, and that she's nearly ready to start running biodynamic preparations and inviting people to learn with, with her about how to make biodynamic preparations. Right. And Ruta said that she'll give announcements on the biodynamic page for the northwest of England if people are interested in joining her with that. Great. Yeah. It's, it's impressive to see, yeah. to go around biodynamic farms and just actually see the, the vibrancy of the food that's grown there. Um, it seems to be magic, but it's actually, you can make a lot of sense of it if you look at it as in terms of microbes. It, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I think I've gone through most of the ones that people asked. If you want to unmute yourself as well to ask a question, that's completely fine. We'll put them in the chat. Um, have Food Futures got any projects planned um, to do any more community growing projects or food projects? So, um, we're not, I'm not very good at communicating what Food Futures is, so this is a good practice. Um, but Food Futures have now five working groups. Um, one is focused on community food skills, and that group have loads of plans and they're connected in with lots of people that are wanting to start new community food growing initiatives from people in Morecambe that are trialing micro gardens through to the average cabbage setting up another claver like project near Ray. Um, there's a lot of groups locally that are keen um, to start. And um, so through that community food skills group, they have also um, been during lockdown contacted all the schools in the district and they're looking at supporting schools and setting up food growing initiatives as well whether on their own grounds or whether schools adopt a local green space to start um, running outdoor education activities around growing whether that's on food or other things um, 
And then we have these other um, working groups made up of various different representatives from our local food system. So we have a food poverty and access group, a food procurement and economy group, um, a group that's looking at the ecological footprint of our food system, and there's one more, and a food and health group, which has helped put on this Lancaster Health Festival. And the role of those groups isn't necessarily to, necessarily to start projects, but it's to have that space for bigger thinking about what we need here to shift our food system. And then people come and um, they want to do that strategic thinking. And sometimes we get people who just want to come share an idea for a project and they just need people to say, yes, go for it. And we support them in setting up new projects. So there's loads of stuff going on in all of these working groups. But if Anne, you want to, if you have an idea for something, or if anyone else here has an idea for something that they feel is needed in Lancaster District, um, you are very welcome to come to any of those working groups or just email us at Food Futures to share your idea. And I'm sure there will be people that have enthusiasm to help um, progress ideas or start them. Anna, do you, want, do you want to just mention the plot as well? The plot, because there'll be a lot more organic food available next year. Yeah, so for those that um, haven't heard of the plot, um, one, one initiative that has come out of Food Futures is, is a farm start scheme, which is now called the plot. And the aim of um, farm start is to set up a training site that supports new entrants into growing. Um, and so people sign up to the Farm Start program. They are supported with a grower, an experienced grower, to go through a number of growing seasons and they develop the skills to run their own um, market garden of whatever focus they're interested in. And then the Farm Start scheme, once they've gone through that, um, what we will do at, at Food Futures and through the plot is to support farm starters once they've gone through the training to broker sites around the district to set up new um, growing businesses. Um, so the plot um, was designed through lots of different um, co-design sessions with different stakeholders from the city council through to county council through to local farmers um, and people interested in becoming growers and it's developed a 10 year strategy for getting this ring of growers around the district again. So that vision that Rod shared is one that we're very much, we have, we hold, and we've got a, a plan for how we think we can enable that to happen locally. So if you want to learn more about that, you should um, read the, the strategy behind the Farm Start project. And I can put that in the chat. I think a, a key thing that's important of this is also to be aware that a thought can become reality very quickly. I mean, a year ago I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have a, a Northern Real Farming Conference? And now it's happening next week. And it's got people from all over the north of England, all over Scotland coming together. So I think we can, we can use that strategy. If it's a good idea, it's something that's really needed, it will happen. And I think it will happen in this area. Um, and we can make a lot, a lot of changes that will benefit everyone in the district. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be chatting with you, Anna. That would be great. <laughs> and just to share that, um, our food and health group is the one that needs most energy around. I'd say um, we've worked with public health over the years, but because of the way funding keeps getting cut the people we work with change we've also and the person at city council level responsible for food she's just overburdened with right. responsibility so we really need support in connecting up with ccg and their strategy which does look amazing at the moment yeah bay, bay medical are, have are really pushing forward with population health and connecting up groups and they are getting funding to do that so it'd be really good to connect connect up with them. That that it would be great if you could help us with that. Yeah. Any other questions?
So I'm just going to put the plot information in the chat for you. Um, okay. Uh, hello, hello. Can I ask? <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, thank you very much, Anna and Professor Rod. This is a question for him. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I asked before about the that system which is about biofertilizer, how to produce it. I never see, see, saw it before. Yeah. Um, you know, because I, I've been doing research on this topic, I feel that sometimes uh, some terms are, are used uh, exchangeable, exchangeably. So um, I, I want to ask Professor Rob if he... <laughs> uh, if he establish a difference between an organic amendment and a biofertilizer. Because what I understand in the scientific literature, we describe a biofertilizer as that microbial species. Uh, not, not, you know, um, has not to be uh, related to the organic matter you know, you can't supply that mic microbial species to the plant without supplying the organic matter as well as organic amendment. So that was would be one question. Uh, the other is he, uh, in case he when he mentioned biofertilizer, he also meant uh, organic amendment. Uh, you know, as I'm trying to uh, enhance the the performance of the digestate of the anaerobic digestate as fertilizer um, is difficult to uh, make understand people that the performance of these organic amendments are going to be comparable to the NPK as he mentioned. Uh, in addition to all these claims of benefits, how he is playing people uh, that this uh, organic amendment is going to give crop yields comparable to the chemical mineral fertilizers. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll just get a book. I'll get a book to show you to start with, which is the second getting it. Whilst Rod's getting the book, are there other questions before he, he could return to answer that very good question? Right, I found it. Ah, put you back. Great. So this is the book. Love. So it's called The ABC of Organic Agriculture, Phosphites and Stone Meal. So that's, and it's by Giro, G-A-I-R-O. Restrepo, R-E-S-T-R-E-P-O, Rivera, R-I-V-E-R-A. Um, and he, he runs courses down in the Forest of Dean as well um, on how to use, the, use these biofertilizers. Um, the thing, thing that with the biofertilizers is the fertility of the soil is to do with the the bacteria and the fungi feeding other bacteria, feeding the, the nematodes. So the fertility is in we, when each of those dies. So when the bacteria dies or when the fungi dies, when the, it gets, comes out in the feces, that's the part that feeds the soil. So it's about actually building the soil from the organisms in the soil. And as it works through the food web, that's what builds up the fertility. I um, mean, the, the biodynamic system in, in Egypt, they've been built up really good levels of organic matter when there's been completely desert. And that's purely by using a biodynamic preparation to get the microbiology going. Um, in some other desert areas, they've been using mob grazing. So bringing in the livestock, the livestock manure, 
stimulates the soil organisms and it builds the fertility. So that's really where once, once you've got a healthy soil, those minerals are already there. The nitrogen, the phosphate, the potash, everything's already there. It's just whether it's available or not. What we're doing at the moment is we're aerating the soil. So we come along and we plow it up. We turn all the microorganisms over. We need to add NPK to, to the soil to get some fertility to get things going again. But actually by giving that big burst of air into the soil, it locks up all the nutrients. So it's, it's very complicated how to, to work out what's happening in the soil, but it is, it's understanding that in almost every soil, there's enough minerals there. If it has the right biology, it can become fertile. So getting the biology into the soil is the key to fertility. Hello. Yeah, I just my quick response. Okay, thank you very yep. much. And um, as you said, you mentioned you are going to attend into another farming conference. So I, I will do as well. So hopefully I can have a, a more conver more detailed conversation with you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I am like a big uh, defensor of the slow release fertilizer. You know, and uh, to prevent the leaching and the nitrates problem in the underground underground water. Uh, however, uh, all my fancy claims, I cannot back up those claims uh, with the crop yields. And I 100% I agree with what you are saying. The nutrients are there. Why the plants are not growing them? Do, are they growing? With, we, don't know, we don't have the data. Uh, just saying that. I agree with you. And I hope uh, we can have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I would recommend um, you go and visit Rod's farm, Alejandro, to have that conversation. It's very close to Lancaster and I'd very, very happy to take you there as well. <laughs> I I, thank you. I wish I could do an interview with him. Thank you. Yeah. As All part right. of my research. Thank you. All right. I'll put you two in touch because I'm sure I have your email from Eventbrite. So I'll make a note to do that. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions before we finish and close? No? All right. So um, I am going to thank you all for coming um, and thank you, Rod, for your time and pulling this presentation together. There's been a request to share it. So is it okay if I share your presentation? You sent it to me, so I'll share it with everyone else. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will send you the evaluation link as promised after this session. So please fill it out. It's useful for us to know if you found this hour and a half useful and how we could improve it. Um, so yeah, thank you again. And I'm going to stop recording.